Our scripture uh, today is going to be coming from Genesis chapter 25. Let's read verses 19, and uh, we will stop at verse 28. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful, skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. This is uh, one of the most important texts in all of Christian and Jewish history and theology for making explicit what has been made clear implicitly through the Genesis narrative. Now, before I enter into that teaching and explain that, I'm going to draw your attention to the text that we're not studying today, which is the first 18 verses of Genesis chapter 25. Those are the verses where we say goodbye to Abraham, our patriarch of faith, and his story is sealed, as Genesis often does, with a genealogy to wrap up his life. I remember saying, I think often through the book of Genesis, as we've walked through it, that it doesn't seek to be a science book, nor is it a strict chronological history book. Let me prove that. Isaac is 40 years old when he marries Rebecca. That puts Abraham at 140. Isaac and Rebecca struggle in barrenness for 20 years before she becomes pregnant with twins. Abraham would have known these twins, probably held these twins and seen these twins because he would have been 160, still 15 years before his death when they were born. But the narrative in the narrative gets rid of him in his life first. That's because the author isn't trying to give a strict chronological order. Genesis hardly ever does. The author, remember, is telling us a story. And this story has theological proclamations. And it serves his purposes, in other words, the author's purposes, to move Abraham off the stage so we can get to the next act. In other words, we need a new hobbit. Abraham is hinted at in our text, if you are close enough to see it, but purposefully, intentionally not mentioned. When Rebecca is struggling in her pregnancy, the Hebrew there says it's so bad she actually wants to die. So we're talking about morning, noon, and night sickness. She can't eat. Her stomach is rolling over and over like there's a war going on inside her because there is. And so the text says this. She goes somewhere to seek guidance. It says, so she went to inquire of the Lord. Now, most theologians in the Hebrew uh, translation hints at, and certainly Jewish tradition will tell us, and I think I agree, that Rebecca is going to visit Abraham. It's a prophet, her father-in-law to inquire from him about what's happening inside of her. And so the Lord is going to speak to her through a very old and devout prophet named Abraham. His words become the Lord's words over her life. Now, I think that's simply enough to understand our context uh, today. And this is it. The faith journey, the seed of promise, will now shift, the author is telling us, to Isaac and Rebekah. The narrator is finished with Abraham, even though he's still on the scene in the narration. In other words, in the story, he's still there, but the author's finished with him. And that means that the faith journey will actually be seen more clearly in Rebecca than in Isaac. She's the one where we have seen her say yes to the Lord in our text. Not that Isaac hasn't, but it's not highlighted anywhere in the narrative. There's an, also an obvious motif that the Lord wants us to know if he goes to Rebecca, and that motif is of barrenness. God is choosing his blessing once again to come through closed places, places in their day that would have been considered cursed places when they're closed, almost as if God is walking his people into cul-de-sacs where everything stops until he opens the way again. 
Sarah was barren, remember? And now Rebekah will be barren. And then Rachel will be barren. And Hannah will be born barren. And of course, all of Israel, the nation herself, will be called the barren one in the scripture and in Isaiah. Now, these are two competing concepts in the Bible that's larger than barrenness, but you should know it. One is the idea, the concept of divine blessing. The other one is human insufficiency, folly, or conflict. Man cannot do it, you see. And so that provides the tension that will carry us all the way through the Bible to Jesus Christ. The human way, the way of folly, must show itself to be not only insufficient, but incapable of of securing any blessing from God. God must do God things because the human way is closed to God since the fall of Eden. It's no longer possible. So now we come to this text and suddenly that idea that we're faced with, that idea of God blessing us and we need, and that we need God to do it, that reality is in our text in such an explicit way today that I think it almost shocks our modern ideas of fairness. Now, I said, and you, you, I'm sure, didn't disagree with me, that God chooses barrenness as a way to show his glory. But if you're thoughtful, you'll see that God is doing lots of God things and doing lots of choosing things all through Genesis. God is doing God things all the time, and the reasons are almost always unknown to us, and yet we are usually very thankful for them. God steps into a dark and formless void, and he chooses to create, and we applaud He chooses to form animals and creatures of the sea and humans, and he breathes life into them, and we applaud. God does not leave us in our sin, and although the curse will remain over our lives outside of Eden, he chooses to make a way to bring some home after the fall, and we applaud. But then there are darker undertones in our text when God chooses Abel the younger and not Cain the older. We're not sure if we should applaud. But then we figure, after all, Cain's sacrifice was unworthy, so he probably deserved not to be chosen. God then chooses Seth as a lineage of salvation, not Cain. It will never be Cain, the Bible wants us to know. Kingdoms rise and a kingdom falls at the Tower of Babel. All nations are dispersed and under a curse. But God's choosing and his will will not be thwarted. Then we see that God chooses Abraham, and we again applaud. Now, the more intuitive among us become hesitant and maybe pensive, and we're not sure if we should applaud because the question in the text that isn't answered is why Abraham? In fact, we're not even asked to wonder about it. God initiates connection into a dark pagan idol-worshiping family and makes himself known to Abraham, and Abraham answers the call. But his father, Terah, doesn't get that call nor does his brother Haran, nor his brother Nahor, nor his nephew Lot. So why Abraham? Do we simply assume in our human minds that the others had ample opportunities to respond to God and they did not seize them, but Abraham did? We would like that, wouldn't we? But no, God chose Abraham, and the theological implications are not explored by the author in the text, but it's there nonetheless if you want to look at it. God doing God things beyond our understanding. We actually have a word for that. Most people call it the doctrine of divine election or unconditional election. I like to simply call it sovereign choice because the other terminology seems to place it in a denominational framework instead of a biblical framework. But for the purposes of this sermon, let's just call it God doing God things, which means he actually does things and he initiates, and we don't understand why. We're never, we don't have the human comprehension as to his reasons or motivations. Now, the reason we have to spend a little time in this doctrine this today is because although the concept is an uncomfortable one to explain and expound upon, the author is the one that moves it into the center of our story today. God has pronounced something over these two babies in the womb that a mere human would never know, nor would they ever pronounce over little babies. One will be stronger, and the older will serve the younger. Now, without other context, you might take that to mean that God, through Abraham, is just giving some sage prophetic advice about how things will work out in the future because they are seen ahead. But the text will not give us the option to do that because the New Testament writers translate this event for us and then frame it theologically. 
Paul says when speaking of the promise and the blessing and why some are saved and not and why his heart is so full for the Jewish people and why won't they accept him. He's trying to get people to understand God's ways are mysterious and active and definitive and they're always good. So what does he do? He brings up Isaac over Ishmael. And then he says, Sarah's barrenness, but God chose to have a child through her. And then he picks up this very event and he says this in Romans 9, verses 10 through 15. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, see now his purpose there is to say there's nothing to change, there's nothing different between these children. It's just the same man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. And that's our text. As it is written, he says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Now he's anticipating what you probably are feeling. Is that unfair? So he anticipates that question and he says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice? Remember that question, injustice on God's part? And he says, God's sake, no. By no means, he says. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And so the Apostle Paul frames for us this theological proclamation in Genesis 25, and more than that, it's important for me because it's the lens through which we are to see these two separate lives unfold over the next several, several hundred years for them, or several years for them, and several weeks for us as we study it and walk through it. Now, again, I want to remind you, we did not have to do this with Abraham, although it was there in the text. We only were given the gift of walking with Abraham, and his life was not in close proximity or in conflict with the walk of his brothers. They are, uncom they are comfortably hidden away in the text, but the theological concept was there, if you can see it. Abraham's brothers were not chosen. God had not initiated his presence in their lives. He had not set his divine, sovereign, choosing love over their lives. Now, however, it's going to be front and center. And now we must see the journey of Isaac and his transformation from being a complete and utter heartless rascal to an old man of faith. And we must see it as a spiritual journey made possible because it was ordained and chosen and determined by God. The pre-birth blessing of Jacob over Esau is exactly why Jacob becomes Israel. And absent of that blessing, it's why Esau remains Esau. The chosenness of God determines the life of Jacob. The absence of chosenness determines the life of Esau. <sighs> Difficult, right? Now, we're never told why God makes these choices, or this one, certainly. But the designation, uh, the designation of Jacob is inscrutable. He will carry this ring. The baton will get passed to him. And therefore, his character must be transformed to God's choice of him, which is happening first. Now, the, the, the interesting human dynamic, and I think the beauty of this text, the humanity of it, is that Isaac doesn't agree with God. <laughs> he chooses Esau. And even the author of our story, which we think is Moses, He's also not completely captivated by the special position of Jacob in the will of God. Everybody in our narrative inside the text will have a natural inclination toward Esau. Let me tell you why. First of all, he has the natural rights. There are cultural, institutionalized social systems that provide all of us order. And the ideal of primogeniture, which is the idea that what belongs to the first and the eldest son, was larger than simply one of those rules in a society. It was the linchpin of an entire ancient civilization. And I'll say even up until probably 100 or 200 years ago. This is the thing that provided order and stability in our cultures. Why? Because this is how they determined privilege and calling and advantage. It has nothing to do with feelings. Feelings would be unfair. It will, be, it will not be left up to the shifting whims of changing emotions in parents and who can get on their good side. The eldest has a place. He must assume it. And he will be gifted in the end, in the, this idea, with extra gifts from the dead to counteract the weight of that responsibility because the crown is heavy upon the head of the one who rules. 
That's just how it worked for thousands of years until God does God things. And he denies the conventional reasonable order because he's saying to us that that order must also be a cul-de-sac. God will not abide by human wisdom. He's doing something different, and we will never know why. Not really. Isaac's love for Esau is not just for legal reasons. He likes him more. The narrator has a bit of affinity for him as well. And so do we. He's more attractive. He's the stronger one. He's the one that won the war in the womb. He's the first to be born because he deserved it. The narrator actually says this of these two boys. Esau was a skillful hunter and a man of the field. <laughs> Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. <laughs> right? You're supposed to feel that. The narrator is wanting you to feel something. Isaac the dad loves Esau's strength, his ability to thrive in this harsh world around him. Isaac loves his food. He's a meat eater. He likes the smell of Esau. He smells like earth and fields. His hands are hairy and callous. From all the toil, all the ancient girls want this one. He doesn't have to toil for a bride like Jacob. He's the life of a party. He's gregarious. He, he's the one with all the good hunting stories, the one that got away and the one he killed just in time before it killed him. And sure, he's brash and he lacks caution and, and thoughtfulness, but that's why you get married. The women can do that. Now, that's not my commentary. I'm trying to get you to see the movie that's playing in their lives. Esau is perfectly equipped to thrive in his world. Jacob hangs back with mom, quiet, calculating, living in the tents. Not the strong one, not the hunter. He will have to survive on vegetables, which means he won't always be able to take care of himself. We get the feeling that he's not the attractive one either, not in form and certainly not in personality. He will always have a deeply ugly side. He will work from his conniving nature more often than not. He will kill you like Esau, but not with his spear. With his maneuvering, backroom deals, his manipulation of alliances, Jacob is playing chess and Esau wants a cage match. The text gives us reasons to love Esau and Isaac picks those up for us. The text will give us no reason to love Jacob. In fact, it simply says, Rebecca loved Jacob without any reason, except we know only one that's given in the text and it has nothing to do with Jacob. God has set his love upon him. He has been chosen. Now, the rest of Jacob's narrative from chapter 25 through chapter 37 will have all of us as well questioning the choice of God of this one. That's how we're supposed to feel. There is only one mention in the entire Bible of Jacob's faith. So when you get to the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, it only says this, and it will only come at the very end of his life when he blesses Joseph's sons. That's it. And, you know, listen, I want to be fair. Esau does not make good decisions. He sells his birthright for soup. He takes a couple of Canaanite wives. What's a guy to do? They want him. So there's intermarriage with him and polygamy. But the narrator is framing it in a sense for you to know that Esau's just being Esau. He doesn't know any better. No one's telling him anything different. In fact, you see this in the text when Esau overhears his father sending Jacob away to Abraham's ancestral land, this is chapter 28, to find a wife. And for the first time, Esau hears that his Canaanite marriages are unpleasing to his father and at odds with the promise. He responds and listen to these sad lines, 28.8. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please his father Isaac, Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, daughter of Abraham's son Ishmael, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. Right? That's not going to fix it, Esau. But he's trying. You see, the, pro the proclamation over the text is this. Look at who Esau will become in the absence of supernatural intervention. Not good. But look what Jacob will eventually become. Yes, in spite of who he is, yes, he will become Israel. But it is with the determined will of God over his life and multiple supernatural interventions, even God coming to wrestle him. It's as if the text is telling you God is making one and Esau is making himself 
In other words, and I know this is hard to understand, the chosenness of God is everything. Let me show you briefly how much this doctrine is not only explicitly stated but assumed by even the New Testament writers because of what they learned from the Old Testament. 1 Thessalonians 1.4 says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, what do they know? That God has chosen you. Why? Because our gospel came to you not only in words but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Did you see the order? We know you were chosen because you responded to the gospel. It doesn't say you were chosen because you responded to the gospel. Oh no, you responded and therefore now we know who's chosen. Paul sees himself therefore not as saving people himself but discovering the saved ones through his preaching. Acts 13, 48 says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. It does not say you were appointed to eternal life because you believed. It says the appointed one believed. So in other words, 100% salvation. The ones who were appointed believed. Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 says, No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. It does not say, say the Son chooses the ones who know the Father, like he's going around picking the ones who know the Father. He says, no, the, you, you know the Father because I chose you. John six thirty seven says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. Think about that. All that he gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I'll never cast out. It does not say, whoever just comes and listens to me and hears me will go to the Father. No, he says, all the ones the Father has given to the Son will come to me. Now, what I want to point out is, listen, there are many extensive sections in the Bible that give a deeper theological treatise or argument for the doctrine of divine choice or sovereign election. I guess my point is, these are not those sections. I'm just trying to show you the order is an underlying assumption under which all salvation texts must submit. They are not fighting one another like we think they are. That's why in the Bible we have the symbolism of the book of life, right? You've heard of that, the book of life, and all that the book of life must communicate to us. Now, I think there is an actual book of life in heaven, and I actually think that it's there. But the Bible says in it is written all the names of those who will be saved. Jesus told his disciples, that their names were recorded in the book of life in Luke 10. He doesn't say, maybe later, we'll see. You're already there. It shows up in Hebrews 12. The book of life shows up in Daniel 12. It shows up in Philippians 4. It shows up in Psalm 69, Psalm 56, Psalm 139, Malachi 3. It's not an obscure doctrine in the Bible. And then it's all over the book of Revelation seven times. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it tells us that those who are saved will be in the book. And then it says in Revelation 13:8. And those names were written into that book from when? The very foundation of the world. And, we, and uh, Chan read that for us earlier, the same kind of text. People asked me when we were earlier in Genesis, they said, do you think God knew when he created Eden that we would fall? Farther than that. The names of those who will be saved were written in the book of life before there was a fall in Eden. Now, I, obviously, unlike others who are much smarter, do not have the brain capacity. I just want to be honest. I don't have the brain capacity to put it all together in a way that I understand and it makes sense to me and I figure out all of the contingencies of this. It's beyond me. I actually, as a pastor, get smashed in the mystery of the dignity of human will and God's sovereign active choosing. And I don't have the weeks to fully engage this topic. Not now. But... What I'm doing is setting up something for us so that we understand because the writer wants us to understand something else here. And the Genesis record will no longer give us leeway to ignore it. And the apostle is the one who puts the flag in this text to make sure we don't ignore it. So that means that he wants us to watch the text moving forward closely. And what we will see is Jacob slowly, slowly fits and starts and jerks with a terrible record, just like his brother, of polygamy. But more than that, deception, manipulation, and evil human scheming, he will become the nation of Israel. And that will not happen so that God will finally pass his promise through him. It's God's determinative choice that makes Jacob into Israel. So even if we have, and we probably believe, should have deeply confused, confusing emotions about the doctrine of election, 
we certainly must understand in the book of Genesis what God is showing us in the Jacob narrative that we are going to walk through together over the next several weeks. He's showing us that God will choose to use what is unwise in human standards, what is weak in human standards. He will use those who are not like Jacob to shame those who are like Esau. He will bring forth his plan of salvation in the cul-de-sacs and the dead ends of life. Why? Because, and we can say this all the time, the hope of the world is the glory of God. And how will God best show his glory? Through the things that are not. And so f clearly, for whatever reason, God's glory is going to be most clearly seen through Jacob. That's why he's chosen. Now, I could anticipate many, many questions because I know our church and the people who are with us that will arise out of this doctrine and the abuses of this doctrine. Some of them, most of those questions come from, I think, a lack of understanding of what true free will is and isn't and what that means, or the difference between foreknowledge and predestination and what those words mean, and the unintended conclusions and consequences about what God choosing means for his character, and more importantly, what God not choosing some means about his character and his goodness. And I think I have lots of answers to those questions, but we're not going to do that right now. For now, let's just sit with the proclamation in Romans about this event. And this is the proclamation. Jacob was chosen, and therefore he will be transformed. That's it. The precious ring will do its work in his life. The baton that's passed to him, the baton of grace that comes into his hand, because there's no reason for it, will change his life. He is not transformed and therefore chosen. He's chosen and therefore transformed. Esau will not be transformed because Esau isn't chosen. God has made his choice. One, Esau deserves justice. Now, obviously, if you understand the doctrine of depravity, you have a little bit easier time with this, but all deserve destruction. All deserve justice, including Jacob. And so Esau deserves justice, gets justice, and the other one is extended grace. So God chooses to show one justice, chooses to show the other one grace, but no one, Paul says, is treated what? Unjustly. And this choosing itself must not be a cul-de-sac. There is a so that with every choosing. It's actually not personal or human, as I've tried to show you. It is for what? God's glory. There can be no dead end for God's blessing. It must always move through us into the others until the full gift of humanity, whatever that is, is given to Jesus Christ at the wedding supper of the Lamb. It goes through us. It can never stop. That's why God chooses. Now, I've thought a lot about Jesus dying on the cross, and I would think sometimes in my moments of devotion, did he actually know in his earthly form all of the names in the book of life when he was dying on the cross and covering their sin. And I assume that he did, but I don't know for sure. But I do know this. Jesus did not die for a hypothetical bride. He saw her. You know why I know that? Because God set his love upon her from the foundation of the world. He knew who she was. There's a sappy song that people used to play at weddings in the 80s. Longer than there have been fishes in the ocean, higher than any birds ever flew, longer than there have been stars up in the heavens, I've been in love with you. And that's a goofy song, and it's completely impossible if you're human, but it perfectly communicates God's choosing love upon the bride the Father has chosen for him before the beginning of time. In other words, every Christian must say, I am not loved because I'm valuable. I'm valuable because he loves me. So when somebody says, what's your story? Why are you saved? You have to say like I do, I don't know. I don't know. This is my story. Praise God. I have no idea. The minute that you start talking about anything that you've done, any decision you've made, any good choice on your part, it becomes merit and it's no longer grace. If I've ever made a good decision for Christ, it's because he loved me first. 
So I can say, why are you saved? Don, because before there were stars in the sky, before there were fish in the ocean, God's been in love with me. And because he loves me that much, he will have me someday. He has me now. Let's pray. Dear Father, we pray over this doctrine, this difficult doctrine, and the implications that come up in our human mind, the things that we understand and don't understand, but let us not take away from the beauty of understanding that all of us deserve justice, which means damnation. And yet you have chosen, because you want to see your divine glory to be seen upon the earth, you've chosen some by which you will save. And Father, that invitation certainly has gone out to all the nations. And as we send out that invitation, Father, it will be revealed to us your bride. And so help us to walk in confidence, but also in humility, because there's no reason that we are loved so much by you. Your love has been set upon us before we've done anything like Jacob, good or bad. It's in your great holy name we pray. Amen.